Thanks so much. Your son has a guy, man. Oh, how are you? Good, good, good. Well, that looks super exciting. It's not. It's super fun. Is that one ever? Alright. Do I have to talk into this? Just that one. Yeah. Alright, cool. Thanks. Oh, there's a whole bunch of cold beers outside. Um, all right, hi guys. You might make a quick start. Um, my name is Rohit. Now you might know my brother Samir, who's a more hipster, lamer version of me. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some pediatrics. Pediatrics as a whole is a fairly low yield area. Um, as with everything in fourth year, they're all kind of low yield individually. But if you just keep seeing them, then they'll add up and you'll fail. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Hing on Room and MSK. Um, I don't know how to change slides. Okay, so just a few things that I think a few of the other lecturers have been kind of telling you as we go, um, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, so exams are sooner than you think, um, and you need to be starting to practice OSCEs um, and MCQs, EMQs right now. Um, oh, glad you could join us, Sheree. Um, <laughs> so if you haven't been doing these things, uh, you're probably starting a bit late, but um, it's good to start now. And for, for EMQs and MCQs, it's heaps of online databases, past test, past medicine, BMJ. I personally use BMJ. I thought it was a really good resource, a nice app that goes with it. Um, as for OSCEs, even if you don't have any friends, talking to the people online, um, you can still practice by just talking to yourself five minutes about the management of every condition. If you can do that, you're going to be in good stead for a GP OSCE. Um, just going by those 10 steps. Um, for the next rotation, especially for those on women's, you need to be starting to study now. There's a lot of content to cover, um, for especially women's health, but for any sort of rotation, you need to be st starting that sort of study now, um, getting ahead of it and making sure that you have about a month to sort of revise at the end of the year. Um, and it comes a lot closer than you think. Um, as I said, pediatrics is a pretty dense field, but the key to pediatrics is you just need to know a little about a lot. Um, for those of you that may have watched my Optile lecture last year, it's the same sort of concept, just a little about a lot. Um, and just knowing the key words, which in this lecture I'll have in blue, um, are the things that you really need to be taking away from this talk. Uh, and for those that will be going into final year next year um, and not being med size and not failing, um, you need to be having a one eye on the internship process, um, especially for those of you who have had recent GP rotations and you might think that you've really impressed that GP, you might be thinking being a reference from that GP. Memories are short. Um, as much as you remember your GP so well, they've probably forgotten you uh, and might ask your name every second week because they don't know who you are. Um, and memories are short in this context, so if you're really thinking of getting a reference, um, I'd start planting that seed now um, so that you're not emailing them in a year's time um, and they have no idea who you are. So worth keeping one eye um, on that sort of process, but keeping uh, the other eye firmly on the vial. Um, all right, so in terms of pediatrics, just for those who haven't done it yet, there are heaps of resources out there. These are probably the ones that I use the most. Um, lots of lectures, including from Mumis and Muppets, which, is, which are really good. And the textbook that I use was Illustrated Peds. Um, OK, in the outline of today, um, there are heaps of topics, so four big topics. Um, we'll cover them in as much depth as I think is necessary, which isn't going to be a lot. Um, but I think, as with the off lecture I gave, if any of you have seen it, the key things are to know how similar presentations differ. Um, and I'll be having those slides kind of very obvious so that when you go home, you can just kind of pick out those seven or eight slides, and that's kind of your study for this whole area of PEDS. I was supposed to cover endo today, but in reality, there's probably four topics in endo. One of them you covered last year, type 1 diabetes, and possibly to a lesser extent, DKA. DKA also has nice guidelines in ICH. Um, and in terms of rickets, again, there's nice guidelines in vitamin D deficiency in ICH. Um, and congenital adrenal hyperplasia, uh, I've never seen it on the exam. I've never seen an endo question for, on the pediatric exam. Um, but those patients will just have Addisonian features plus ambiguous genitalia. So it's fairly straightforward. Okay, so I thought something that um, might be interesting was just to spend maybe 10 seconds th thinking about each of these DDXs. When you're faced an OSCE um, from fourth year, I don't know how many minutes you get, is it four or eight? Um, to, to think about the station, 
you want to be spending a minimal amount of time thinking about the diagnosis and probably most of the time thinking about how you're going to manage the patient as per the 10 steps, which is really what you should be using for basically every single OSCE station, not just because um, it's a useful framework, but also because you don't know which station is a GP. Um, and it's important to have that 10-step framework for everything. So the diagnosis is really a small part, but if you get the diagnosis wrong, then your whole sort of station is falling apart. So interesting just to think about diagnosis of abdominal masses, um, of bone pain, of thrombocytopenia, of anemia, neutropenia, so all the blood lines being low, uh, of a limp, and of a joint pain with rashes. And they all have different sort of things, but a lot of them are quite similar um, in each category. So be aware of those. So we'll get right to it. So heme onc um, is one of the larger sections in the pediatric exam. Um, relatively speaking, it's about 10% of the exam um, to 15%. So just as an overall statement, pediatric cancer is rare, but it has a really good survival rate. People come into peds thinking the peds ward is extremely depressing and so forth. And yeah, it's not great to see kids with cancer um, doing my pediatric um, onc heme rotation right now but they generally get better. Um, and that's something that doesn't happen with adult cancer. And adult hematologists, often their patients die. Um, and there's plenty of really bad cancers that happen in adults that don't happen in kids. Um, another word about pediatric cancers is that they kind of split into three different groups. So there's groups of cancers that are of embryological tissue. Um, and those, by definition, will present really early. Um, so if you see anything with blastoma in it, and the question has someone who's a 18 year old, um, it's probably not the right match for that question. Similarly, um, the juvenile cancers and the adult cancers are kind of of a more mature tissue. Some just inherently present in a juvenile way, i.e. adolescent way, and some are adult cancers, which you don't need to worry about for feeds. Okay, busy slide. Um, unfortunately, the other thing with peds is because it's so easy, they like to test you on these sort of mundane um, associations. And I've just listed a handful of them here, probably the ones that you might need to be somewhat aware of. Um, and they do like to test some of these in weird ways. Um, so you might not know a lot about Leaf-Ramini syndrome, the P53 mutation um, that's characteristic of Leaf-Ramini syndrome, but you might need to know that it's associated with sarcoma, for example. Um, and there are heaps of these, and I'll just add that list there just for your reference. Maybe if you have a spare five minutes a day, you can read over it and just try and memorize as much as you can. Um, but some of the really important ones would be things like Down syndrome, which is a potential OSCE in itself. You need to be um, anticipating the sort of features of Down syndrome, such as hypothyroidism, such as leukemia, such as Alzheimer's disease, because the APP gene is on chromosome 21 and they have three chromosomes um, and so forth. So for your reference. Um, just a final uh, general point on oncology is there's a lot of sort of nomenclature regarding treatment. And I don't think you need to know much about it. Um, it really only comes into play when we're talking about febrile neutropenia and sort of the, the grittiness um, of onco oncological treatments, which you don't need to know much about. Um, just know that there are generally sort of three main phases, those being induction, consolidation, and then maintenance, and they kind of go in that order. Okay, so we'll break it down oncology into a few different parts, sort of solid tumors, um, CNS tumors, um, and then the leukemias and lymphomas. Um, so I've just kind of based it on like just the questions you get in an EMQ or the questions that you might get in an EMQ. Um, and there are roughly 35 of them and there's roughly 20, 35 of you. So we'll just kind of get each one, each person have a go at each one. So I'll start at the front with you. Um, so we've got a three-year-old girl with a recent history of weight loss, pallor and irritability. She's got periorbital ecchymoses and bone pain. A full blood examination reveals evidence of bone marrow suppression only. So these are all straight from the Monash exam. They're not difficult questions, hopefully. So I didn't give you the options because you don't need options. <laughs> and if this was an OSCE stem, you don't get options. Um, this is unlikely to be an OSCE. Any ideas? Neuroblastoma. Yeah, nice. Say it confidently. You did a good job. So neuroblastoma. So a few quick words about neuroblastoma. Um, it's a neural crest tumor, it's an embryological tumor, right? It's a blastoma. Um, so you're going to be expecting it to be in young children. Uh, it secretes catecholamine precursors and also their enzymes. So unlike a pheochromocytoma that just secretes catecholamines kind of nonstop, these tumors also secrete their breakdown enzymes. So you're un unlikely to get those sort of high intensity adrenaline related um, symptoms. It's most commonly of the medulla 
um, of the adrenal glands, thus it's an abdominal tumour. Um, but there's a, a lot of various sites, um, anywhere on the sympathetic chain, for example, it can be in the neck, um, it can be down in the pelvis, uh, but most commonly it's going to be in the abdomen. Um, and the adrenal glands um, sit mostly midline um, on either side, so it's going to be more of a midline tumour. The clinical features do vary with location, but because it's mostly abdominal, you're expecting a large palpable abdominal mass, which is relatively easy to feel in the demographic, which is a very small sort of one to two, three year old demographic. Um, it may cause symptoms of mass effect, such as constipation or anuresis. Um, if it's a thoracic tumor, I'm talking about the cervical um, sort of um, areas near the neck, you might get a Horner's syndrome ipsilaterally. Um, it often presents with mets to the bone, um, i.e. stage 4 disease, um, and mets to the bone present with bone pain, um, which if it mets to the bones near the eyes can cause the raccoon eyes that we described in the question. Um, and it also presents with bone marrow suppression because it's still meted to the bone. So those two things are the common things that they ask in the exam. You might get the catecholaminergic symptoms as well, but as I said, they do have the breakdown enzymes, so the headache, the hypertension is not a really big feature. In terms of the investigations, I don't think you need to know a lot about it. Obviously, you can see the urine catecholamine metabolites, which is a thing I have in blue. There are certain functional imaging that do help. I think knowing that much detail is enough. Um, and the biopsy buzzword from one of the either past test or past medicine was um, homorite rosettes. Um, I haven't seen that on a Monash paper, but I don't write the exam. So in terms of the management, just with all of these things, there's no detail because I I don't think you need to know the detail, and I don't know the detail. Um, it's some combination of surgery, chemo, um, radiotherapy. Um, and there's one stage of neuroblastoma that just rem just kind of remits by itself, and um, that's stage 4S. But again, you, you probably don't need to know much about it. Cool. Case 2, Mac. So a 4-year-old presents because <clears throat> maternal concerns about increasing abdominal distension. She also noticed that sometimes the son appears to have blood in his urine. Yeah, nice. Wilms tumor. Yeah. So, next question, following one from Will's tumor, which of the following conditions is going to increase the risk of Wilms tumor? Yeah, back with Wiedemann syndrome. Yeah. So this is one of those very weird sort of questions where they just throw eponymous names at you, and you just hope that you know it. Um, in my exam, we may or may not have had a similar question. Um, so ataxia, telangiectasia from the table has lymphoma, leukemia, beckwith Wiedemann syndrome, that overgrowth syndrome um, has Wilms tumor, um, FAP has colon cancers, um, Pugh-Zager syndrome has a variety of tumors, it's got benign hematomas, um, and also it's got sort of uh, other, not really associated with those hematomas, but other sort of GI um, and pancreatic tumors, trisomy 21 we just talked about, leukemia, and ulcerative colitis has colon cancer as well. And I think that's not a bad way to approach every question. Um, don't stop it back with Wiedemann. That's fine. You got the answer. Well done. Pat yourself on, a bat, on the back. But kind of go through the other options as well and figure out what you know about those. And knowing as much as I've said about them is probably sufficient. Um, you can go overboard if you like, but I'm a pretty simple sort of person. Um, okay. So so this is another one that's going to present with an abdominal mass because the kidneys are in the abdomen. Um, so it's the most common presentation is the abdominal mass. Um, that doesn't cross the midline because the kidneys are sort of more lateral than the adrenal glands, if you can kind of imagine it from sitting on top medially. Um, the biopsy shows features of immature kidney cells, which isn't surprising as well. Um, and your management usually, usually by nephrectomy. Um, sorry, I skipped the association. So we have uh, beckwith Wiedemann syndrome. We also have Dennis Drash syndrome, which presents with Wilms tumor and also ambiguous genitalia. So again, that's all you need to know about it. So the next one. So we've got a two-year-old girl who's examined by her uncle, who is a medical student practicing for his exams. It's a bit weird. He notices that she is not clinically jaundiced, but has significant hepatomegaly. The girl's father has a history of multiple colonic polyps. Yeah, hepatoblastoma, so three tumors from the abdomen. Hepatoblastoma, nice. So um, surprise, surprise, it's a tumor of immature liver cells. Um, it's associated with FAP and also Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. Um, in this case, FAP was the um, answer. Um, hepatomegaly, um, an abdominal mass where the liver is in the right upper quadrant. 
Um, the, the investigation that's really key is the blood marker AFP that's often raised, um, and you just manage it often surgically, plus minus chemo and other things. So I think the key differentiating points um, is something that's sort of worth emphasizing. Um, and these are the sort of things that I found useful in PEDS and just generally in fourth year. If I have a lot of conditions that are similar, if I can just pick out some things that are different between them, it means that I don't need to know a lot about them and it's very easy for me to pick the right answer. So the neuroblastoma and the nephroblastoma and the hepatoblastoma, they're all affecting young people, young toddlers. And they all have an abdominal mass. The neuroblastoma will have bone pain, it'll have the raccoon eyes, it'll have bone marrow suppression. Nephroblastoma will have a midline sort of mass uh, sorry, a mass that does not cross the midline, and it may also have hematuria. Um, the hepatoblastoma, it'll be a mass localized to the right upper quadrant. So you can kind of tell them apart. Um, blood work and other investigations, you're looking at urinary catecholamine metabolites. You might be doing functional studies for a neuroblastoma. Um, for a nephroblastoma, it's mainly the biopsy. And for the hepatoblastoma, we have raised AFP. Yep, so just some very basic key differentiating points I found to be really useful for fourth year. Um, so we'll move on, um, we'll go up the row. So a young child with leukocoria, um, and you're looking at the fundus. Is this yeah, it's retinoblastoma. Um, what are the other causes of leukocoria, just in the general population? Anyone? Cataract. Yeah, cataracts, by far the most common um, in diabetics. Um, and why do you get it? Why do you get leukocoria? Why do you get leukocoria in any of these? Yeah, exactly. So the red eye reflex is red because the retina is red. Yeah. Um, and if the retina is not red because you have a cataract in the way or a tumor in the way, uh, whether that be a retinoblastoma or whether that be a melanoma, the most common ocular tumor in adults, um, you're going to get an impairment of the reflex. Uh, well, it, the, the difference doesn't really matter in a clinical sense. And it's probably most of the choroid because the blood vessels are red. But again, the difference doesn't really matter. Um, so retinoblastoma. Um, cool. So it's also called the cat eye reflex leukocoria. So it's a malignant tumor. Um, it can be bilateral um, if you have an autosomal dominant mutation. Um, and that's obviously devastating consequences for the patient because then they need bilateral enucleation. Um, and that's pretty much all you need to know about it. Um, it, it. You can't really mistake retinoblastoma for any other pediatric pathology because you don't know much about the eye otherwise. Um, we'll move on to the next person. A four-year-old boy is being examined during a possible viral ERTI. On examination of his nose, a white mass almost completely occluding the right nostril can be seen. No, anyone want to help him out? No, so this one's a rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, so rhabdomyosarcoma is from the words you might think skeletal muscle, um, but it's of tissue that was destined to form skeletal muscle, but it might just be anywhere else. Um, most commonly they're in the head and neck, um, around the orbits, around the nasal septa, as is the case here. Um, and th they have a variety of clinical features if they're in the eye and around the orbit, they'll cause ophthalmoplegia, they'll cause ptosis. If they're around the nose, you'll have, you might see the mass, they might have epistaxis, they might have nasal obstruction um, or a full nose. Um, investigations, imaging, we can kind of see uh, the tumor here um, in pretty obviously. Um, and the management is again, not really important, but some variety of resection, chemotherapy, radiotherapy will suffice. So moving on. So we've got a 15-year-old girl with nocturnal ankle pain. Yeah, nice, osteosarcoma. Um, so osteosarcoma is a malignant bone tumor, uh, the most common malignant bone tumor in kids. Um, and it's classically um, just above or below the knees, so the sort of metaphyseal regions, and that's worth knowing. Um, it classically presents with pain that's worse at night, um, but bone pain in general. Uh, often these patients get found out because they have a fall um, and hit their knee and then their knee gets x-rayed and it's like, oh shit, there's a tumor. Um, and that's not an uncommon presentation. Um, 
Investigations, as with any bony pathology, you'll get a raised ALP. Um, you'll get a raised ALP in Ewing sarcoma. Um, you'll get a raised ALP in even vitamin D deficiency. So by, ALP by itself being raised is not a huge deal. Um, the x-ray, there are multiple buzzwords associated with this tumour. Um, so osteosarcoma is generally a very aggressive tumour. So generally the buzzwords are those of an aggressive bone tumour. Um, so looking at the sort of top picture, the periosteal reaction tends to be more so towards the very aggressive side. So we get the spiculated sunburst appearance, or we get the Codman's triangle, which are demonstrated here. Um, it's worth knowing that in real life sort of medicine, you can get those appearances with a Ewing sarcoma as well, but in Monash medicine, which is distinct from real life medicine, um, those two don't seem to be associated with Ewing's. Um, again, management is some degree of surgery, chemo, radiotherapy, um, and whatever else you feel like adding. Um, so with that in mind, and we're on bone tumors, you can't get the next one wrong, Cherie. <laughs> so, a 10 year old boy with proximal leg pain and low grade fever. Yeah. No. <laughs> So I think she said Ewing's. Um, good job, Cherie. Uh, very intelligent. Um, so, so Ewing's sarcoma is the other bone tumor, primary bone tumor. Um, it's uh, the second most common. They commonly have a translocation between chromosome 11 and 22. Not sure if that's worth knowing, but it's present in nearly all the tumors. Um, they often have local pain, but the pain is a bit different. Not it's it's sort of local rather than at the knee where it commonly is. Um, and it's usually difficile lesions, so the pain is exquisitely local. Um, again, they'll have a raised ALP, um, and the classic sort of thing you see here is an onion skin periosteal reaction, which was on the more um, less aggressive side of that above diagram that we had before. Uh, and the management again, some degree of surgery, chemo, radiotherapy. Um, a lot of these lesions, you don't require an amputation. Um, a lot of people think that when you get a bone cancer, it's the uh, end of that limb. Often you can just amputate part of it. Um, and there's a lot of bone salvage techniques, especially um, utilizing the fibula, which seems to be a good bone that we don't really need a lot of. Um, okay, so again, some key differentiating points. Obviously with a rhabdomyosarcoma, um, you can't really mistake that for the other two because it's not in the bone. Um, it's just kind of there just because I felt like adding three things on the slide. Um, osteo and Ewing sarcoma. So we're both talking about adolescence. Osteosarcoma is usually prepubertal. They're often around 10 years old. Ewing's, they're a little bit older. Um, sorry, osteo, the, that's the other way around. Osteo, they're usually a little bit older. Ewing's, they're a little bit younger. Prepubertal, often around 10 years old. U osteo is usually a metaphyseal lesion. Um, Ewing's is usually a diaphyseal lesion. Um, it's usually in the legs and osteos, in the, in the knees and osteosarcoma, so it's knee pain as opposed to local pain. Um, that might be in the legs or it might be in the humeri. Um, we don't really know between where the lesion is. X-ray, we're thinking more aggressive features in the periosteal reaction, so sunburst or Codman's triangle. And we're thinking more onion skin or onion peel periosteal reaction um, in the Ewing sarcoma. So it's a generally a less aggressive tumor than the osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma is also the most common. Okay, moving on to CNS tumors. So just a quick differentiating point to start off with. Um, CNS tumors in kids are mainly infratentorial. The ratio is about 60-40. Um, and in adults, it's quite significantly the other way, where most tumors are um, supratentorial. So that's the first thing that's kind of important to remember. The problem with the infratentorial space, i.e. the posterior fossa, um, is that it's a very tight space. Any lesion there is gonna cause hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus in kids has numerous manifestations that you need to know. Um, but it's generally, in a very basic sense, it's obviously going to be symptomatic. You can get a tumour in an adult grow to quite some size before you might get a seizure or you might get symptoms and mass effect. So that's the key difference. So paediatric tumours are going to cause a lot of mass effect, uh, even if they're very small. So, moving on, what do you reckon? We've got an eight-year-old boy with progressively worsening headache, nausea, and vomiting, which doesn't help because we know that those are signs of raised ICP. But the, the lesion might help you. I think I heard medulloblastoma. Yeah. Good. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so, yeah, medulloblastoma. Um, it's a tough question because you're not really expected to sort of see this sort of imaging um, on the exam. So I'm going to pay it anyway. So um, what we can see here is a nice big midline mass, as you correctly identified. 
um, and massive hydrocephalus kind of looking at a slice much further up. Um, so medulloblastoma, um, it's a WHO grade 4 lesion. So in terms of WHO grading, so the World Health Organization grades CNS tumors between 1 and 4, 1 being sort of very benign, meningiomas are a classic example, and 4 being quite aggressive tumors, medulloblastomas and sort of other age groups, glioblastoma multiforme, which is now known as glioblastoma, um, are the classic sort of grade 4 highly aggressive lesions. So this is a rapidly growing aggressive lesion. So these patients are going to present with rapidly progressive hydrocephalus. Yeah? Um, so because it's in the cerebellum, the vermis, which we know is a midline structure, um, it tends to protrude into the fourth ventricle and cause massive hydrocephalus. And it's aggressive, as I said, so it's going to be an early sign. Um, there are a variety of manifestations of hydrocephalus from infants. You can look at head circumference is something worth measuring, looking at the fontanelles to see if they're bulging or full, um, looking for things like the sunset sign or the limitations of upward gaze, which are very late symptoms, to adults, which have more symptoms akin with... Um, sorry, and children which have symptoms more akin with adults because they don't really have the fontanelles open and able to sort of allow more pressure to build up. In terms of the investigations, standard stuff for cancer. What are you going to do for them? You're going to do some basic bloods, nothing that will really help in this case. You're going to do some basic imaging, which will help in this case, and you're going to do a biopsy, and then you're going to treat them. That's kind of how cancer works. Um, and management, some sort of surgery, if it's possible, um, and radiotherapy and chemotherapy. The manifestations of hydrocephalus are worth knowing, and um, in uh, the illustrated textbook, they have a sort of good diagram explaining that sort of stuff. So, next one. Again, these are hard, but I'm not that sorry for you. Um, the two-year-old girl with features of hydrocephalus, surprise, surprise, and palsies of the 9th, 10th, and 12th cranial nerve. So that tells you where it is in the brainstem. Hmm. I... Yeah, it's in the brainstem. I'd almost call it a glioma. Yeah, so it's a brainstem glioma. Yeah. Um, so, so it's not that complicated. Um, so it's a uh, brainstem glioma. Is uh, it's a, it's a variety of conditions um, with various who gradings. Um, the one I saw today was a was a who grade three, but they commonly who grade one. Um, they present with a myriad of clinical features, depending on where they affect the brainstem. So this patient had medulla, um, was affected, and then we know from the rule of fours, the last four cranial nerves are in the medulla, 9, 10, and 12 are the ones that I picked. 11 kind of has a spinal accessory component, it's a bit more complicated. Um, they can have long tract signs, depending on exactly where they are. So the long tracts are just the spinal cord tracts that come from the brainstem. Um, and obviously hydrocephalus is another big feature. Um, again, the investigations are the same as before. The management is roughly the same as before. Um, these, these patients can present with pretty much anything. Um, the one I saw today presented with Harlequin syndrome. If you've heard of that, um, just Google it. It's very rare, um, but they do happen. It can present with anything. Um, so moving along to another difficult one, um, and the last one of CNS, an eight-year-old boy with a headache and bitemporal hemianopia. So bitemporal hemianopia should guide you to where it's approximately. What? Yeah, nice. Yeah, really good. Yeah, craniopharyngioma. Um, so craniopharyngioma is a tumor of Rathke's pouch, which, which becomes the anterior pituitary through some magical embryological way. Um, that it's not worth knowing. Um, the clinical features are similar to that of a pituitary tumor. Um, so fairly obvious by temporal hemianopia, local mass effect features causing that, um, a headache, as you'd expect. Um, they're a who grade one lesion, so they're very sort of indolent, um, and you don't need to know much else about them. The clinical history or the exam that was in that question pretty much gives it away. So the key differentiating points, again, I, I, I can't stress how useful I found this sort of thing to do. Um, just it really breaks it down to very easy steps. So medulloblastoma, aggressive, brainstem glioma might be aggressive, craniopharyngioma, not aggressive. Medulloblastoma, it's rapidly growing, it's going to cause obstructive hydrocephalus as an early sign. Brainstem glioma, it's variable, so other signs might precede it, such as cranial nerve palsies, long tract signs, um, obstructive hydrocephalus is often a bit later. Um, craniopharyngioma, it's 
pretty much where the pituitary gland is. So it's going to cause symptoms of a pituitary macroadenoma, thinking things like headache uh, and thinking things like visual changes by temporal hemiopia being the most common one. So key differentiating points, really important. All right, so moving on again. So leukemia and lymphoma. So what's the difference between leukemia and lympho lymphoma? Anyone want to shout out what they might think? Yeah, absolutely. So what difference will we see on a bone marrow biopsy? Yeah, leukemia has more blast cells and lymphoma has less blast cells. Um, and that's basically the key difference between them. Furthermore, because lymphoma is going to be from lymph nodes and mature cells, it's not going to have any myeloid cells is the other difference. Yeah, leukemia can be lymphoid and myeloid. Um, and I've just got that in writing um, in case uh, you need to read it. Um, so next question. Um, so we've got a two-year-old boy, and I'll accept two answers for this. Um, who presents the ED with a history of recurrent nosebleeds and um, parental concerns around increasing pallor and lack of energy. His blood examination shows an anemia and high white cells and low platelets. So what's the diagnosis? Yeah, ALL. And why would you say that and not AML? Is, a is AML not a cancer of white cells? Okay, <laughs> so yeah, it, it is, um, so, uh, well, it can be. Um, so yeah, this one was ALL, um, and on the exam, luckily they didn't give you ALL and AML, um, so it was easy to make the diagnosis. So acute lymphoblastic leukemia or lymphoma, um, and how you differentiate them, as Max said, is just based on the amount of blasts. If they have more than 25% blasts, um, then you're thinking that it's gonna be a leukemia, and if it's less than that, it's a lymphoma. That's kind of the arbitrary cutoff. There are a variety of clinical features. Um, most of these are B-cell tumors, um, and the precursor B-cell ALL slash LBL, which is the lymphoma um, uh, shortening, um, is the most common. Um, and it presents with infiltration of the bone marrow, which causes the uh, cytopenias that we saw before. Um, and it presents, and thus you get anemia, thus you get bleeding, you get bruising, uh, you get recurrent infections um, sometimes as well. Um, you often get lymphadenopathy, you often get hepatosplenomegaly, um, and there might be CNS involvement, but you try and sort of stop that. Um, there are other sort of tumors present differently. Um, you can get mature B cells, um, lim leukemias or lymphomas, which also are called Burkitt's lymphoma, which present in a much different way, um, and we'll talk about that later. So the investigations, you probably don't need to know it in depth. Um, there's a standard sort of leukemia battery that you would have learned last year that are generally done, including things like an FBE, coags, an LP, providing they're not too neutropenic, um, which they usually aren't in ALL, um, and microscopy, um, blood films, bone marrow spritz, and cytometry and cytogenetic testing. You don't need to know anything about other than that they exist and that they're really important for risk stratification and diagnosis. Um, in terms of the management, I think it's just worth knowing that not only do you give chemotherapy, but you also give intrathecal chemotherapy. Intrathecal just means we're injecting it into um, the CNS, so via a similar mechanism to a lumbar puncture, um, and that's to stop CNS leukemia, um, which can really, really destroy um, the prognosis of this condition. Um, in terms of staging and types, you don't really need to know it. There's a French, American, British classification with L1, 2, 3 um, as there, but I don't think it's really worth knowing. So acute myeloid leukemia um, has, as the name suggests, myeloblasts, um, which include things like neutrophils, which are white cells. Um, so it's the most common adult leukemia, but it still presents in kids. Um, it's associated with Down syndrome. Um, one of the types is, and they classically present with, the big thing they present with is DIC. Um, they also have anemia, they also have uh, other things as well, but DIC is a really big presentation, and one of the particular ones, um, M4, uh, which one is it? M3, um, promyelocytic leukemia, really presents with DIC. And the only reason I'm making a mention of APML is because if you see this in an ED as a fifth year, as an intern, as a doctor in the future, you can actually treat it at the bedside um, and stop this person from dying in front of you with DIC. Um, 
and you treat it with something called all trans retinoic acid, ATRA. Um, it's worth knowing that because you might see it once or twice in your career, um, or so I've been told, um, and you can treat it at the bedside. In terms of the investigations, it's the same battery. The buzzword you might see is oil rods um, that are seen in most AMLs, and then you can get bundles of oil rods in APML, um, and the oil rods are basically just stacks of granules um, that are released and can cause DIC. Um, again, CNS protection plus chemotherapy is what you need to do. So case 13. Um, I don't know who we're up to, next person. Uh, a nine-year-old presents with a three-week history of cough, difficulty in lying down, and some stridor. He's known to have supraclavicular lymphadenopathy. Yeah, I mean, we just did leukemia, so it's gonna be lymphoma. So this one's non-Hodgkin's. So basically how we can classify lymphoma is uh, either non-Hodgkin's or Hodgkin's, and um, non-Hodgkin's, we've talked about Burkitt's lymphoma, and then there are some some of which are cutaneous, some of which aren't. And then there's Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is its own sort of category that has four specific types. Um, Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So there are a lot of types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and kids, they pre present in a different way to adults. And I think that's just worth knowing as a start, because what you learned last year in terms of may or may not have B symptoms or whatever is not really relevant for kids. In kids, they present with a rapidly growing mass. It's commonly in the abdomen, but it can be in the mediastinum. Um, and it also can be in the head and neck, but abdomen mediastinal is where you want to be thinking. And this patient, obviously, mediastinal mass. Um, they often do have B symptoms, um, and they often have lymphadenopathy, as this patient did with supraclavicular lymphadenopathy. And because it often presents with a rapidly growing mass, they might present with an emergency oncological presentation, such as acute respiratory distress from stridor, or maybe um, SVC obstruction, or maybe they have a blast crisis or something. Um, it's worth knowing that they generally present with an emergency, as this patient did, as their first presentation. Um, management, it varies a lot. I don't think you need to know much about chemotherapy agents. I mean, maybe it's worth knowing some of the side effects because you might see these patients in GP land, for example. Um, the vincristines commonly get peripheral neuropathy. Um, the patients on um, the platinum drugs, the platinum-based drugs, they commonly get um, lots of vomiting and they commonly get renal dysfunction and hypomagnesemia. Um, and so forth. But I don't think it's worth knowing too much about the different drugs. So these patients present with a rapidly growing mass. As opposed to Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a slower growing mass and nearly always above the diaphragm. So it's usually always a mediastinal mass, but it often doesn't cause an emergency because it's such a slow growing mass. And that's not to say it's an indolent mass, it's just slow growing. Um, and again, they can have B symptoms as well. So B symptoms aren't a great differentiator between the two um, in pediatrics. Um, it can be associated with EBV infection. Um, and the management, again, is very much the same. Uh, and you don't need to know in great detail as again. So these four leukemia and lymphomas, how to break it down into really simple points. So the ALL is the most common cancer in children. It's going to be in young children. Um, it's usually presenting with cytopenias, um, anemia, bleeding. Um, often there's bone pain, especially bone pain at night um, that wakes the child up, for example, um, and hepatosplenomegaly as well. AML, usually a younger person because the risk increases with age to a degree because it's the most common adult tumor. So it's usually an adolescent. It's less common, has a Down syndrome association. The catastrophic consequences presenting with DIC, so heavy bleeding, but it also has the anemia. It also will have the bruising. Um, and on blood film, you have the oil rods that might point you towards this diagnosis. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, again, you're thinking a child or an adolescent. It's aggressive. Um, it's also common, so it presents with an oncological emergency. So think like things like stridor. Think things like SVC obstruction. Um, also has lymphadenopathy, as we saw in the question. Hodgkin's lymphoma, on the other hand, it's a slower growing mass in an, uh, in an adolescent or young adult population, increases with age, um, the risk, might be associated with EBV. The mass is nearly always above the diaphragm. It's nearly always mediastinal. Um, and lymphadenopathy again. Um, and both of them have B symptoms. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I'm not sure why the, the association exists either. Some viruses and other pathogens, as you know, have some sort of association with cancer. Um, EBV is one of them, um, HIV another, um, 
obviously the you know uh, Kaposi sarcoma is caused by a virus, H. pylori, those sort of things. I'm not entirely sure why it's associated with Hodgkin's. Um, also, again, if you give a Hodgkin's patient, um, especially an adolescent, a drink of beer or something, they'll get pain, um, as with the adult patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma. I didn't mention it there because most kids don't drink beer, but who knows? Uh, okay, so cytopenia is just as a general topic. Um, I know that anemia is done to death in third year, so I'm just going to cover the ones where things are a little bit different in pediatrics. Uh, if you really want to delve into vitamin B12 and folate deficiency, uh, then you do that from last year's notes, um, because there's just not enough time. So one thing to just be aware of, and perhaps not so much in the exam, but more so, well, perhaps in the exam as well, is really pay attention to the reference ranges they give you for pediatric patients. Um, you might see a, a small child, it's like 90, that sounds anemic if I had a 50-year-old guy on the ward in, in my general surgical ward. But for a two-month-old, that's fine. So just being aware that the blood um, hemoglobin thresholds are a little bit low, lower for kids. Um, and that's also important when you're in the ED and, you know, in future years and things like that, just to know that they, you don't want to be transfusing kids who are actually fine. Um, so another question. Uh, I think we're up to the back row. Um, so a three-year-old boy is being investigated for possible celiac disease. Hemoglobin electrophoresis is normal, and his full blood count shows that he's actually anemic. Um, his white blood cells are fine, platelets are fine, and MCV is a little bit low. Sorry? Yeah, absolutely, I agree. What's the most common? Iron deficiency, yeah, nice. Um, iron deficiency anemia. Um, so just to refresh your mind about iron studies again, which are important, um, how iron metabolism works to a very basic understanding. Um, I'll have boxes to just draw your attention to a few things. So iron obviously gets absorbed in the GI tract. Um, it's stored in ferritin, and then it's transported with, uh, out of the cells by ferroportin. And then the carrier protein is transferrin. So those are the things that you need to know to understand iron studies without memorizing them. Um, hepcidin, which becomes relevant in things like anemia, chronic disease, which is not a pediatric issue um, as a usual thing, um, is related to increased hepcidin. So if you have low iron, um, it means you have decreased ferritin because there's no need to store the iron, so there's less ferritin. It means that the the body wants to pick up as much iron as it can, so it increases the amount of transferrin. Um, because there's so much transferrin but not enough iron, your iron binding capacity is high. Yeah, that's the basic sort of gist of things. For hemochromatosis, just reverse it, um, and it's true. For anemic chronic disease, uh, it's a little bit more complicated, um, but your transferrin and your iron binding capacity are generally low or normal. Um, so iron deficiency anemia, um, the main causes in kids can still fall into the similar sort of categories that we can divide them into adults, that being blood loss, decreased absorption, and, and dietary problems. Um, so the blood loss is, in adults, you're mainly thinking of things like peptic ulcer disease um, or a colon cancer um, that you're just missing. Um, that's obviously not the case in kids. Um, UC can be there in more adolescent sort of um, demographics. Meckles, don't forget the Meckles diverticulum and Meckles diverticulitis. Um, cow's milk protein-induced colitis, which was worth, which may or may not have been worth knowing for my exam. Um, menstruation in sort of older adolescent females um, and bleeding from elsewhere that might be there. So don't forget your bleeding diaphyses. Um, if someone's bleeding into their joints, for example, because they have hemophilia, that would also cause an anemia. Um, reduced iron absorption, much the same as adults. You're thinking of celiac disease, um, surgery, Crohn's disease. Um, reduced diet. Um, the big reduced diet thing that I really want to get through to you guys is infants with cow's milk. Um, so that may or may not have been really, really, really relevant for an OSCE that I did. Um, may or may not have been. Um, and childhood peak is another thing. So kids sometimes do dumb shit um, and sometimes they're eating clay um, because, you know, that's what his mate's doing, so why not? Um, and that clay actually binds to iron, um, and it also causes iron deficiency. Another thing is giving young kids tea. Um, tea can also cause iron deficiency. I didn't have it up there, but it's another thing that causes it. So really think of cow's milk as a really, really big thing, um, especially in infants that might, have, that might or should be on breast milk. There are other prenatal factors that might cause an iron deficiency at birth. 
um, prematurity, maternal iron deficiency, or rare syndromes such as twin-twin transfusion syndrome that you might have heard of in one OBSGYN lecture if you were at Monash. Okay, so the clinical features are very straightforward. They're of the same sort of symptoms that you'd expect with an adult. Um, it might be easy to hear the flow murmur or so-called stills murmur. Um, kids sometimes, interestingly, get pica from iron deficiency anemia, but they're not eating clay. They tend to eat ice, um, frozen water, not the drug. Um, and the investigations are the same um, that you did do for anyone. Uh, and they're summarized here, but it's really a revision that you should probably know that from 30. And if you've forgotten, that's fine. Just revise it. Um, the management is usually because it's dietary, often due to cow's milk. Um, RCH guidelines kind of strongly push a dietary sort of um, spin on the management. So modifying the diet or giving iron supplementation. Transfusions rarely requ required. Um, and I've kind of copied these sort of verbatim from the RCH guidelines. Um, and if they're not responding to that sort of dietary therapy, then you can kind of go hunting for your more interesting sort of conditions. Um, whether those be those malabsorptive ones like celiac disease or, um, you know, uh, Crohn's disease or something like that, um, or looking for occult bleeding, or, you know, maybe the parents are actually not enforcing the iron regimen that the doctor suggested. Really important to know that sort of stuff. Um, it could definitely be an OSCE station. So case 15 on the theme of anemia. Um, a seven-year-old boy is brought to his pediatrician for an annual checkup, routine blood work, um, demonstrating so low. Um, electrophoresis shows diminished HbA1 and elevated HbA2 um, and normal HbF. So lots of different hemoglobins. Yeah, alpha or beta. Yeah, nice. Um, minor. Um, so this is a topic that you might have covered in third year. Um, so I'm not going to go into it too much, but basically we have four main sort of hemoglobins that exist. Um, HbA or HbA1 is your normal hemoglobin with two beta chains, two alpha chains. I have this HbA2, which is kind of grumbling around the background, um, that has these other chains with the A. I think they're, are these zeta chains or I'm not too sure um, what that Greek letter is, but some other chains. Um, so alpha thalassemia, without getting into too much depth, um, it has two genes. Um, and so this is the normal sort of person with a balance of um, alpha and beta chains. And I think that's really what you're looking for with these conditions. It's all about the balance between the, the, different, um, uh, the different chains you have here. So a normal balance um, in a normal person, someone with a alpha thalassemia um, minima, someone who's just lost one gene, um, it's still quite balanced, not really a problem. Someone who's suddenly lost two genes, um, and those people are interesting. So the people who have lost two genes on the same chromosome are more likely to be Asians. Um, and that's really important because that means the people who have more serious complications, i.e. the more serious forms of alpha thalassemia, they're pretty much all Asians because all of those will have two genes lost on one chromosome. The Africans are really associated with one lost on each side. And thus, this is pretty much as severe as it gets for them. Um, it's really the Asian population that has a really bad for alpha thalassemia. Um, so in these patients, uh, it's still okay. The balance isn't great, but it's still okay. They might get a mild anemia. It's when it starts getting a little bit more imbalanced where you get beta chains that are kind of just going by itself and creating something called HBH that damages cell membranes and causes mass hemolysis. Um, and again, this is only in Asians because only Asians will miss out two genes on the same chromosome. So these patients get quite severe um, hemolysis. And then if you lose everything, um, you're only really making tetramers um, of the gamma chains, um, so it's really, really bad. Um, and you get fetal high drops, which has a terrible prognosis um, and is pretty much always incompatible with life. Um, so important to remember that. Beta thalassemia is autosomal recessive, only involves one gene, but it has three alleles, kind of different types. Um, so again, it's all about a balance, but because the beta... Um, chains are made in a chromosome uh, that has the same genes for um, HBF and HBA2, um, there's a little bit more leeway in terms of beta thalassemia. Um, so with beta thalassemia trait or minor, you start getting a ramp up of some of those um, HBF and HBA2. And as it gets a little bit more severe, um, you ramp those up as much as you can, but often it's not enough. 
your HbA2 can only ramp up so far and your HbF really goes quite heavy. Um, but then you still have these alpha chains that just bundle together. And like the beta chains that clump together in HbH, these alpha chains destroy cell membranes and cause mass hemolysis. Um, so it's not good. And you get the clinical features that you guys would have learned last year's buzzwords, chipmunk faces um, from all the extra medullary hematopoiesis that's happening. Um, fractures of long bones because the bone marrow is just destroying the bones are weak. Um, hepatosplenomegaly, gallstones that can happen with any hemolytic anemia um, and so forth. And I guess the, the it really comes down to um, electrophoresis for these patients. In beta cell uh, thalassemia trait, you're really looking at um, the A2 being ramped up, um, whilst in the more severe forms, you're looking at HBF being ramped up because um, A2 has just gone as high as it goes, um, which isn't a lot because it can only go so far. So it's really up to the gamma chains to really ramp up its production. Um, and then HBH disease, which is the second most severe manifestation of alpha thalassemia, will obviously have HBH, the tetramers of beta chains. Um, oh, and that image is just of one of the classical radiological features of beta thalassemia, the sort of hair on the end appearance um, that you might see. Um, the investigation is straightforward. Just your basic anemia screen as the question, the first question sort of uh, implied with the iron deficiency anemia, just do your straightforward stuff. Um, genetic testing, management, you don't need to know in detail. It's some degree of transfusions, folic acid supplementation, splenectomy may or may not need to be done, bone marrow transplant may or may not need to be done. It all depends on the severity. Okay, uh, moving on. A five-year-old girl recently arrived from Nigeria. It's being investigated for easy particularity and intermittent painful joints. On examination, she's pale with jaundice, uh, pale and jaundice with hepatosplenomegaly. Yeah, sickle cell, yeah, nice. Um, so sickle cell anemia, uh, we know a fair bit about because it's drilled to us in preclin about the mutation um, with glutamic acid being replaced by valine. Lots of different types. It's prevalent in Africa um, and Nigeria, I don't know if the mouse comes up, is probably around there. It's a red spot, right? It's all about Africa and then everything happens in India um, because there's too many people there. So they get all the mutations. Um, so the different types, it's obvious. You're looking at really sickle cell and then you're looking at sickle cell traits and then there's a whole lot of other ones depending on what other mutations you want to have. Um, Basically, these cells under stress, um, the hemoglobin inside the cells will polymerize. Um, and stress includes things like hypoxia, it includes things like dehydration, includes things like being febrile, so if you have an infection. Um, and then it causes them to sickle. Um, and then the sickling affects the cells. Um, and if it's reversible, that's fine. So we often have, well, not often, by definition, our veins carry deoxygenated blood. And as the people with sickle cell disease, their, bloods will sick, their blood cells will sickle a bit as they travel through the veins. But the good thing about veins is they get to the lungs and become reoxygenated. So those cells become fine um, because that hypoxia stress is removed. However, if you have an infection or something where you have a prolonged fever or you've got prolonged hypoxia because you've got respiratory disease or something like that, your cells can start sickling and then they can and causing crises and they can lodge wherever they want um, they can lodge in um, the chest and cause chest syndrome they can lodge um, in the penis and cause priapism um, they can lodge in the spleen and cause splenic infarction um, heaps of things can go on so sickle cell disease typically presents at about six months of age because as i said before your hbf decreases at about six months and then you start getting your beta chains into play. So that's kind of when it starts to present, once your beta chains are actually being used. Lots of crises that you would have known from third year, vaso-occlusive crises, which I just mentioned, a plastic crisis usually has an infective, infective trigger, often parvovirus um, B12, uh, sorry, parvovirus B19. Um, splenic sequestration as well is another crisis to be aware of. And then there are various other associations. The really classic one is salmonella infections of the bone and joints. Um, is really important. Jaundice because of the hemolysis, gallstone, so forth. Investigations, again, if they give you a picture of a sickled slide, you can't get it wrong, um, but they might not, and they might tell you things about electrophoresis and so forth. Um, management is complex. Um, things like vaccinations and prophylactic antibiotics are necessary. Uh, often these patients will have sub- um, Oh, so they'll have splenic infarcts that just aren't clinically seen or appreciated. So their spleen will actually be effectively 
um, useless, and thus they'll need prophylactic antibiotics for the encapsulated bacteria. Um, luckily, we can vaccinate against at least three of those. Um, hydroxyurea promotes the development of HBF, which helps them with oxygenation. Uh, and then you screen for various things, and you might consider transfusion and stem cells. Um, in terms of the complications, the management is very simple for all of them. It's basically IV fluids, red cells, and then stopping their pain if they have some. That's kind of the basic principle for any of them. For sequestration, you might take out their spleen. It's, again, it's not a big deal because many of them also, many of them already have functional asplenia. So taking out their spleen is, the only risk is really the operation. Um, they're still gonna be on the same antibiotics that they were on before. So the key differentiating points, probably an unnecessary slide, but I feel like drilling this into you. Um, iron deficiency, think of cow's milk and infants, that's really important. Um, that's something that doesn't happen in adults because adults drink cow's milk all the time until they become lactose intolerant. Um, vague anemia symptoms, pica, which might be the cause or might be a symptom, um, microcytic hyperchromic anemia, alpha and beta thalassemia we know about. You're looking for HBH, and the other one you're looking for HBF or HBA2, depending on the severity. Um, I've yet to see alpha thalassemia as the answer to any question on an exam. And sickle cell, it's got a different demographic. It's African plus minus the random Indian that might be there. Um, so crises, salmonella infections, jaundice, hyposplenia, whether that be due to no spleen or whether that be due to functional hyposplenia, um, electrophoresis for the sickle um, hemoglobin, um, and the sickle cells on blood film will be obvious. Okay, so a 12-year-old boy with Crohn's disease has been commenced on azathioprine. His mother brings him to uh, our patient's clinic, thinks he looks pale and has a particular rash. Uh, hemoglobin is a little bit low, white cells um, are low, and platelets are also low. Who are we up to? So like HSP? HSP? Um, no. Uh, as in what HSP is or? Yeah, that's fine. Anyone want to help her out? So what, what have we got? We've got everything's low, right? So it's got a pancytopenia. Do you know any causes of pancytopenia? No, not ICP. Yeah, aplastic anemia. Yeah, aplastic anemia. I'm sure you know it. Um, so aplastic anemia, bone marrow failure, multiple causes. Often we don't find the cause, unfortunately. Think of drugs, especially chemo, which does that inherently. Um, viruses, parvovirus B19 is back, um, among others. Clinical features are those of the different cell lines that are depleted. So platelets are depleted, we're gonna get bruising and bleeding. Uh, neutrophils are depleted, we're gonna get infections. Anemia is depleted, we're gonna be fatigued and have pallor and so forth. Um, bone marrow biopsy is the key. And again, um, as you know from last year, you're looking at a hypercellular bone marrow with increased fat, fat spaces that has no signs of malignancy. Um, management is you treat the cause if you can find it, remove the um, offending agent if you know it, um, transfuse them with whatever they need, um, prophylactic antibiotics. Um, you can suppress the immune system with ATG, um, and there are two types of ATG. There's horse ATG and rabbit ATG. Horse ATG is more effective. That's probably all you should know about it. Um, basically, it just destroys the T cells that are kind of trying to destroy your bone marrow, which is a good thing, um, and uh, stem cell transplants similar to what you would have learned last year. Next one, a four-year-old girl with a history of recent ERTI. Um, she's got uh, bleeding from her gums and tickle rash in her arms. She's otherwise well, hemoglobin fine, white cells fine, platelets low. Yeah, ITP, yeah, nice. Um, so ITP, it's autoimmune. We think it's due to um, some sort of antibody against the surface antigens, but we haven't identified those antibodies yet, which is a shame. Um, thus, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So the main thing you want to exclude um, is the cause of thrombocytopenia is, an, is leukemia. Um, and because they have low platelets, they're going to have symptoms of uh, low platelets, particular rash, bruising, so forth. There's a very small risk of hemorrhagic stroke, just about 1%. Even in pa patients that have a, hem have a platelets of less than 20, it's still less than 1%. It's very rare. Um, and there's an absence of those really dangerous red flag symptoms of ALL, such as bone pain, um, infections, because they don't have any sort of problems with the neutrophils, um, lethargy, hepatosplenomegaly, um, and lymphadenopathy. Uh, the platelet count is often low, and that defines the condition. Um, and as there's a lot of red flags that you might see on the blood film that you can go through in your own time. You don't need to know a lot of those eponymous syndromes. I've just put them there for context about why those things are important. 
Uh, management is not do much. Um, RCH recommends we just leave them alone and most patients get better. They could be managed at home. Um, if they're actively bleeding, bring them into hospital. You might be able to save them a little bit with prednisolone. Um, you might be able to help them out with IVIG or platelet transfusions, which are rarely done because the platelets eventually, because they have antibodies to platelets, the platelets eventually go away. So it's really just to stop the acute bleeding. Um, and you just have to wait until it all dies down. Um, avoid things that might trigger bleeding. Um, such as contact sports or NSAIDs. Case 19. Um, so we've got a, an eight-year-old girl, nine days post her first intensification chemotherapy for ALL. Um, she is febrile and brought to the hospital. So it's not really a diagnosis, but a type of oncological emergency. Sorry? Not chemolysis, no. She's febrile and she's probably got neutropenia. <laughs> febrile neutropenia, yeah. So we know about febrile neutropenia, usually between seven and 10 days is the nadir of the neutrophils. Um, so the, does anyone know why the neutrophils are affected most by chemo? Yeah, so they have a, they have a lifespan of about three days. Um, red cells is an example of a lifespan of 120 days. So neutrophils are gonna be affected more so. Um, platelets are somewhere in between. I can't remember, I think it's weeks. Um, the diagnostic criteria is worth knowing, um, temperature above 38.5 or three readings um, above 38 and neutrophils below 0.5 or anticipated to be um, going down and it's already below point, uh, already below one. You do a full septic screen, um, LP is contraindicated in febrile neutropenia. Um, that's worth knowing, in kids anyway. Empirical therapy we know is TADS. Um, hit them hard with TADS, but there are other things that you can do. Um, you can give them hardcore, um, gram-negative covered bacteria, uh, antibacterial agents such as am amicacin. Um, you'll give that to a certain high-risk population such as those receiving um, treatment for ALL or AML um, or those who have just received transplants. You can also add on FANC, you can add on metronidazole um, if they, you think it's gram-positive or you think there's an abdominal infection respectively. Um, and if the fever is still persisting after 72 hours, guidelines say add on amphotericin. Amphotericin is a very hardcore uh, fungal, antifungal agent, um, that's kind of the last line that you would add on. There's not really any guidelines for adding on an antiviral um, at this stage. So really, in adult team, it's really just TAS and it does the work. Um, but in kids, you really, you know, want to look after them, so you consider these other things. And it's not uncommon to have patients on the heme onc ward in pediatrics with amicacin on board. So differentiating these three, um, these four, I've just added ALL as well, the same things as before. You, those red flags aren't present in any of the other three. Um, ITP, just the bruising, bleeding, just low platelets, diagnosis of exclusion, aplastic anemia, all three are down, symptoms of all three down, um, hypercellular bone marrow, um, febrile neutropenia, they'll be on chemotherapy, they'll be the right days post chemotherapy, um, and they might have an infection, um, but you just want to treat it as much as possible. Cool, so we'll move on to room MSK. Um, so room MSK is another topic that you probably need to know less about. So that's probably a good thing. Um, the limping child is a big OSCE conundrum. Um, may or may not have been useful on my OSCE in uh, two years ago. So uh, there are many different uh, differentials for the limping child, including um, by age, including DDH, uh, fractures, child abuse. Um, NAI, um, or non-accidental injury, is a really important differential to consider in virtually any pediatric OSCE. Um, so when you are doing your pediatric OSCE and your four minutes of reading time, whatever it is, write down NAI somewhere, make sure you ask something about it just in case. It might not be physical abuse, um, it might be that the patient's got iron deficiency because they're being neglected. So it's worth kind of just doing some sort of question that addresses that, yeah? How do you ask for it? So it really depends on the context. Um, so if it's a weird sort of injury, you really want to be worrying, you really want to ask about, so what's your child up to development, developmentally? Are they actually able to fall off the cot and roll off the cot and, you know, hit break their leg? Um, if it's an iron deficiency anemia, for example, you might want to be really asking the diet, what's the diet like, you know, why is your child not having breast milk? You know, you want to ask in a tactful way. Um, but yeah, those things you want to be practicing. Um, I think there's a really good lecture on NAI by one of the pediatricians that's done. Um, and a lot of signs and stuff that you can pick that are just weird. So I'd be re revisiting that lecture if you can. Um, but it's important just to mean I, that you don't want to be looking at just physical abuse, but the other sort of things as well. Um, and then in older children, um, transient synovitis and perthes, and then 
some even more older Sufi um, and other things. So, um, Krishna, um, a five-year-old boy has had a recent um, Erti. Um, he is currently afebrile and looks well. He's refusing to weight bear on a on his left leg, um, and the X-ray is fine, um, and the blood tests are fine. Any ideas? <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm going to pretend you said transient synovitis. Um, nice. So transient synovitis. So transient synovitis is really a diagnosis of exclusion in many regards. The question already gave you that they did an x-ray, they did a blood test, and they're all normal. That's giving an idea that it's an exclusionary sort of condition. It's a common cause. It's the most common, but it is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, they have hip pain. They have some range of movement problems. They have some um, problems with uh, weight bearing. But they're otherwise really, really well. There's no swelling. Um, there's no bone pain, they don't wake up at night with this pain, um, they're not febrile, um, everything else is good. 3% um, get Perthes disease, which we'll talk about later, but otherwise it's self-remitting within one week. It's not a big deal. Case 21, um, we'll jump to you guys at the front. Um, a three-year-old boy has a history of three days of high fever, refusal to walk, he looks unwell, has a temperature of 38.5. Um, examination of his leg is really hard because he's in a lot of pain. Any ideas? This is the thing you want to be thinking of first before you think of transient synovitis. Yeah, septic arthritis. Yeah, nice. Um, septic arthritis. So septic arthritis, as per septic arthritis in third year, is a bacterial infection of the joint, commonly staph, but don't forget the salmonella in sickle cell patients. Um, that's one that they really want you to know. Um, clinical features, um, I should have made some of those blue, but basically they have fevers. Fevers is really unusual for any joint problem. When you think of a fever in a monoarthropathy in an adult, it's septic arthritis until proven otherwise. And similar with kids, a fever and a joint problem is septic arthritis until proven otherwise, yeah? How do you differentiate this from the reactive arthritis? Reactive arthritis. So reactive arthritis are often not febrile. Um, and reactive arthritis, well, you're looking at common bugs. So um, gonorrhea is one of the common ones, um, or if you've had you know, recent, recent conjunctivitis or something. Um, but yeah. Patients with reactive arthritis are well. Patients with septic arthritis are unwell. They're febrile septic. Um, good question. Um, and yeah, good use reactive arthritis because Reiter's, um, Reiter was a, a Nazi and he did a lot of bad things. So don't say Reiter syndrome. Um, he was worse than Wagner, um, like considerably worse. Um, so the main thing you want to be doing for these patients is obviously FBE, establishing that they're septic and then doing a um, synovial fluid analysis if you can. Um, in pediatrics, I haven't seen that done, um, but it's something that you just want to be considering as a diagnostic test. Uh, and the management empirically is flu clocks because we think it's a staph infection. A six-year-old is brought to the GP, worsening right leg pain, inability to weight bear. Started five days ago. She's afebrile, but mentions that she fell over on her right knee in the schoolyard last week. The GP notices no swelling or erythema on investigation, on general inspection, sorry. What do you reckon? Sufi? No. Sorry? Perthes? No. This is osteomyelitis. Um, so this patient is has a lot of similarities to the last one, except it's just a more slower process. Um, that's because osteomyelitis is subacute, while septic arthritis is really, really acute. Um, the location depends on the age, but in pediatrics, the femur is the most common joint involved, uh, most common bone involved. Um, so it's generally leg pain, um, refusal to weight bear. Um, they may have erythema, they may have warmth, they may have swelling, but often they don't. Um, septic arthritis, because it affects the joint, often has very prominent swelling, prominent erythema, um, and prominent joint um, warmthness of the joint. That's not always the case in osteomyelitis. And also, they might not be febrile in osteomyelitis either. Um, investigations are the same. Um, imaging is often not useful. Um, and management is the same, because we think it's the same pathogens. So the key differentiating points, uh, and I keep drilling them in, TS, they are a well child. That's the most important thing. Um, S, in septic arthritis, they are not well at all. And in osteomyelitis, they're somewhere in between with some leg, upper leg pain. Um, and the rest is as described. But as with all these patients with bone pain, the thing you don't want to be missing out on is ALL. 
So always consider cancer um, as, a, uh, as a diagnosis. And this is an acute sort of bone pain, um, so ALL. But the, obviously, the osteosarcoma and Ewing's also come into play in older children. Um, so a seven-year-old has a three to four-month history of hip pain, um, especially after exercise. Um, he has knee pain on the same side, and he's got a flattened femoral head. Go to you guys at the back. Yeah, nice. Uh, Perthes disease. Uh, so it's a self-limiting idiopathic avascular necrosis. If it's steroid related, it's by definition not Perthes disease because it's not idiopathic. And they always like to trip you up on that in the exam. Um, the clinical features, uh, as pretty much as the question described, um, it's painful, it's worse on exercise, um, it might be tender, it's in an older child, um, it's often a, it can be a sequelae of TS. Um, the x-ray shows what the question described, flattening of the femoral head, um, and it's clearly visible there. Um, and the management is often just rest, and they just get better, because it's self-limiting, um, so you don't need to do much about it. 12-year-old boy presents with mildly painful limp, um, which he first noticed four weeks earlier. He's afebrile systematically well. He's overweight. On examination, his leg is externally rotated the ankle. Yeah, Sufi. Um, so, I mean, the key things about Sufi is that it's sort of, again, that older demographic. Um, it uh, can present acutely or chronically, but the main sort of thing that you want to be listening for or reading for is sort of an obese sort of kid who's not doing a whole lot, as opposed to the other conditions that affect this sort of demographic, which are more inactive kids. Um, you might see uh, things, um, so you see things on the x-ray. And again, this, was, this may or may not have been really relevant for my OSCEs, um, but it's worth sort of looking at these x-rays and not brushing them off, because you might be given, an OS, an, uh, given one in the OSCE, and I had to explain it to a, to a parent. Um, and how you'd explain this one might be an ice cream slipping off a cone, which is a really classic Rupert Hines description, um, which I think is nice. Um, mild to moderate. On happening, so just do both at once. Um, and if it's a really severe slip that can't really be reduced by pins, then you might need to do open um, reduction in internal fixation. Uh, a 13-year-old boy who's a keen football player develops uh, unilateral knee pain. Um, on examination, the swelling is noted just below his patella. Oh, anyone want to help her out? Sorry? Bursitis? Yeah. Uh, Kind of? Yeah, I'll, I'll scooch later, yeah. Um, so it's similar to the tendon because um, it is involves the tendon, kind of uh, the, a tensile stress on the tendon um, impacting on the tibial tuberosity. These are really active, okay, as opposed to Sufi where they're not so active. Um, well, Sufi, they're far from active. Um, and these patients present with knee problems because, funnily enough, the tendon attaches to the knee. Um, you might see some fragments on the x-ray. You may not if it's early in the disease. And it's, again, self-limiting. Just tell them to avoid whatever they're doing that's making the pain worse, which is usually going to be playing some sort of sport, and they'll just get better. Um, and the last one about this sort of area, a 10-year-old boy presents with a GP with pain that's worse when he's playing soccer. He sometimes notices popping and clicking in the knee. Um, on examination, the GP feels some crepitus in the knee. There's no evidence of meniscal ligamentous injury. Um, the joint's not swollen, and there's no pain at rest. Any ideas? Not, not quite, not quite. This is always one of the options in the exam, so very potential. Sorry? It's not meniscal, no? Yeah, someone said it. Yeah, nice one, Cherie. Wow, good knowledge. Osteochondritis tissicans. Um, so... This is a condition where, again, it's in a more active sort of teenager. Um, and basically, they get osteonecrosis of subchondral bone that can kind of fragment out. Um, and it just presents with the sort of things that you might expect from a meniscal tear, um, or which is sort of the crepitations, the locking of the knee, and that sort of stuff. But all those sort of stress tests will be normal. Um, and it usually affects the knee, but it can affect other joints as well. Um, and the management, again, is rest and kind of avoiding those sort of activities. So in terms of differentiating those four common causes of sort of knee pain in the older child, um, Perthes is of the four in a younger demographic, sort of in the four to 10 range. Um, they're not obese. Uh, they might have had TS earlier. And the flattening of the femoral head is the key x-ray feature. Sufi is the larger child. 
um, and they have acute presentations and chronic presentations and x-ray really classically ice cream slipping off the cone. Um, OSD, again, a very active child with knee pain, um, and you might see fragments from the tibial on the tibial tuberosity. And OCD, the last one, um, again, a very active child and knee pain with activity. They might have locking, they might have clicking, but all those meniscal tests that you might do, the stress tests and whatnot, um, they're all fine. And again, with someone with in this age demographic who has some sort of bone pain, don't forget the sarcomas, right? Osteosarcoma typically presents in people who are post or oh, sorry, in above prepubertal age. So that is a big differential for all of these. Don't forget the sarcomas. Okay, so a medical student is doing an examination um, on a female child six months of age. Uh, she notices that the right leg is slightly shorter than the left, and the right inguinal folds extend beyond the anal aperture. On moving the legs, there is limited abduction of the right hip. The baby is ignorantly cheerful throughout the whole of the exam, which is what you'd like. Any ideas? DDH. Yeah, nice, DDH. Yeah. Um, so DDH, uh, so developmental dysplasia of the hip, um, usually results from a sort of an abnormal relationship between the femoral head and the acetabulum that becomes more prominent with age. So it's worth picking up early, which is why it's part of your newborn exam that you should know for the OSCE because it could be a station on a newborn dummy. Um, the risks are plentiful, but the main ones are that the child is generally female. Um, there might be a history of a breech birth. There might be a family history. There might have been oligohydramnios um, detected prenatally. Clinical features depend on how old they are, but in short, the blue things are important. Um, the Ortolani and Barlow maneuvers are things that will give it away in the newborn. In the older child, you're looking for impaired um, abduction, um, leg discrepancy, length, so really things that are akin to a fractured NOF in an 80-year-old. You'll see in these patients at a very young age. Um, a symmetry of the inguinal folds and stuff, so babies are generally very chubby, so you can appreciate that a lot better. Um, and then walking age children, they have a limp. So the Barlow's and Ortolani's tests, I'm not going to go over because I think that you've done it to death and hopefully you've done newborn examinations as part of your logbook. Um, and if you got that forged or whatever, you should probably do one anyway. Um, and there are various other tests that I think are of varied significance. Ultrasound is useful. That's all you need to know. Um, X-ray is useful in the older child. Ultrasound is useful in the baby. Um, manage them with these fancy harnesses, um, which look really cute, uh, Pavlik harnesses. Um, and if they're older, you can start considering surgery. But you want to be targeting them when they're young, so that's why the Ocelani and Barlow tests are really, really important. And you really, really need to know them as part of your newborn examination. So arthralgia, the second last part. So we've got a three, we're back to the front, are we? Yep. So we have a three-year-old boy presenting with seven days of fever, bilateral conjunctivitis, a strawberry tongue, a large painful cervical lymph node measuring 1.5 centimeters. What do you reckon? So I'm not sure if this condition was covered in by Michael Wang, but Kawasaki, Kawasaki yeah, nice. Um, so this is, this, I think this is a cardiovascular condition, but I'm not sure if it was covered, so I'll cover it now. Briefly, you need to know the diagnostic criteria of Kawasaki disease. There's no question about it. It's a big OSCE station. Um, and the, the, how I remember it, there are multiple mnemonics. Mine was color. I think people use other things. But basically, I have a, a five-day history of fever plus color, uh, which is conjunctivitis, often bilateral, Oral mucosal changes, such as the strawberry tongue, such as the fissured lips, lymphadenopathy, cervical, or, and with a, um, a size of at least 1.5 centimeters, edema, which is often peripheral and then um, has skin peeling um, and uh, the fingers and toes, uh, and then the rash, which is a polymorphous rash, rash, which means it can look like anything. It's not a specific sort of looking rash. Um, and these are some pictures of those things. Fever is often the first symptom, and as I said, it, does, it is really protracted. It usually lasts more than a week, um, and often several weeks. Um, and the cardiovascular things sort of happen a bit later, and those are things you want to be looking out for. And the thing you definitely don't want to forget in your OSCE is the echocardiogram, which you do at presentation because you can get myocarditis as part of Kawasaki disease, and then later down the track because you can get coronary artery disease, in particular coronary artery aneurysms, um, which if they rupture is a complete disaster. So... Uh, really, really important to know. Um, the echocardiogram must be done in presentation and must be repeated in six to eight weeks. No question about it. Other things you might do um, are ASOT, because you might be thinking of acute rheumatic fever. Um, chest x-ray, often not done. Uh, it's because it's usually normal um, in your basic bloods. 
the management straight from RCH, you need to know this. Um, IVIG, some people put IVIG and prednisolone, but I heard that it was second line. Um, it's given for 10 days and you continue it after 10 days if there's still a raised ESR um, or CRP. Aspirin, you have to give it for six to eight weeks, which is an easy number to remember because that's when you do the second echocardiogram. Um, and then you need to delay your vaccines because you can't give vaccines while giving IVIG. They just don't work. Um, so really, really important to know. And the, the second echocardiogram is the thing that most people forget. Um, a six-year-old boy is brought to the GP clinic with vague arthralgia and abdominal pain. On examination, the GP noticed a purpuric rash over the buttocks. The child looks well and is not septic. Uh, HSP. Yeah, HSP, absolutely. Um, he knocks on line purpura, not a halal snack pack, which is one of my third year said in the tutes. So the uh, clinical features are basically as the question described. They often have a rash. It's often purpuric or particular in the buttocks or lower limbs. Um, they get arthritis of large joints, but it's not a septic sort of arthritis look. They're not warm um, and they're not septic looking themselves. They get abdominal pain um, and those three form the classic sort of triad associated with HSP. Other things they get is glomerulonephritis. They get an IgA nephritis, which presents identically to IgA nephropathy. Um, so it's a nephritic syndrome with IgA that will stain vividly um, on immunofluorescence. And they may have neurological disease and respiratory disease, which is the main sort of cause of mortality. Anything from lung hemorrhage to encephalopathy and stroke. Investigations, the same sort of battery of tests that we did for the previous question, you can do again, abdominal injury uh, imaging to rule out any abdominal pathology. So often an ultrasound, you start off with in kids and then move to a CT or an MRI. Um, management is you don't need to do much. Most people recover, um, which is great, uh, but sometimes it recurs. Um, mild pain, you just give mild analgesics for. Severe pain, you might be able to give prednisolone. Um, it doesn't really do anything for the renal disease though. Um, and then RCH pretty clearly mandates in quite long paragraphs that you need to have a regular GP follow-up. Um, and that includes the GP not just having a look at the child and giving him the AOK -okay and the jelly beans, but doing a urinalysis and doing a blood pressure. Those are really, really important symptoms. The blood pressure and the urinalysis are both really good indicators of renal disease um, that you might see in a nephritic syndrome, which these patients can have. And you don't want to be, have these patients sitting at home with a renal crisis. Um, so if there's any problems with those after in sequential, um, sequential GP follow-ups, so then they need to be referred back to pediatrics. Okay, we have a 14-year-old girl presenting with fever, intermittent sore knees, ankles and elbows over the last four weeks. She has a rash um, that I've got a picture of. Uh, and she's got mitral regurge. Um, she has serological evidence of group A strep. So fairly straightforward. Yeah, nice, acute rheumatic fever. Um, again, the Jones criteria is worth knowing. Um, and of them, I would remember the column sort of on, the, uh, on your right um, is the one worth knowing. Uh, that's for high risk patients, which is where we usually see them at. The one on the other side is for the low risk patients. Um, and the key things there, I remember it by strep. Um, so the S stands for Sydenham's Chorea, um, which also used to be called St. Vitus's Dance. Um, then uh, the T stands for uh, transient migratory arthritis. The E stands for erythema marginatum. Um, I forgot, R. R stood for rheumatoid nodules, and the P stands for pancarditis. Um, and the strep really fits in with what the bacteria is anyway. So group A strep, strep pyogenes. Um, the important complication you don't want to miss is rheumatic heart disease, which is why you treat all these patients with secondary prophylaxis with antibiotics to make sure you've cured the strep infection um, as well as you possibly can. Um, arthralgia, you treat with basic analgesics. Synonyms chorea, you treat with anti-epileptics that work to varying degrees. Um, and pancarditis, you treat for heart failure because the big thing with pancarditis is myocarditis, which can present fulminantly with heart failure. Um, Hopefully you don't get that sort of picture. Um, that's more sort of associated with sort of giant cell myocarditis and so forth, uh, but you still treat them as heart failure. Um, so we have a four-year-old boy brought into the emergency department due to recurrent fevers and a rash and joint pains for six weeks. They've been seeing their GP, but it hasn't really helped. Um, so they've, the GP decided to send them to a tertiary center before starting prednisolone. Yeah, JOA. Yeah, a lot of things going on. It's been going on for ages. Um, and Dr. Sue Piper hates people, their GP, starting them on prednisolone. And she's a rheumatologist at um, MCH. 
So JIA, I'm not going to go through in much detail. There are way too many types of JIA, and they're pretty much the same as the adult versions in many regards. Um, and the names give them away from what they are. Oligoarthritis, funnily enough, doesn't involve many joints. Poly polyarthritis involves many joints and so forth. Um, the pain is often protracted. Um, it's had six weeks by definition. Um, and the important thing to note uh, is not to start them on prednisolone, and that needs a sort of rheumatologist to start them on pred. Literally every other drug is done before pred. Um, all your NSAIDs, um, all your DMARDs, they're all done before pred. A summary table for you to look at at home. I'm not going to go through it because it's detailed um, and there's just too much stuff going on. Some of the important things to be aware of are the, the Stills disease rash, which we had in the question, which is classically a salmon pink rash. Um, and they get these spiking fevers up and down, uh, as we can see there. The uh, above the picture in the middle is of anterior uveitis, and we have the irregular shaped pupil um, of anterior snickia, and we have the hyperpion as well. Um, so if those words don't mean anything, I'll look at Yanni's lecture from last week, or my lecture from many, many week, weeks ago. Uh, and then polyarthritis um, shows polyarthritis, and we can see prominent involvement of the knees in particular. Um, and that's a flowchart from RCH, just for your reference. I'm not going to go through it because it's self-explanatory. So differentiating these things, um, Kawasaki disease, very young child, it's a vasculitis, so it's included here. The color features, the rashes of a polymorphous type, so it could look like anything. Arthritis is not a big deal, and coronary artery disease is the big thing. Um, HSP, uh, young child, rash on the, rash on the butt, or the cheek of the, of the um, or the leg, sorry. Um, arthralgias and hematuria, renal disease is what you want to look out for. Um, acute rheumatic fever, indigenous child, the strep features, and there's a lot of minor criteria as well. Um, the rashes and erythema marginatum, and Stills disease is a salmon pink rash, again in a young person, um, protracted sort of six week history to diagnose it, and can involve multiple organs depending on the type. The last thing I'm going to go through is just neuromimics. So for some reason in the matrix, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is classified as a rheumatological condition, um, which is strange. Um, so I'm just going to cover four things that might present with a limp that aren't MSK um, and that aren't sort of uh, rheumatological. So a three-month-old infant, um, who's obviously not limping around, is uh, seen because of poor feeding and slow weight gain. On examination, he's noticed to be floppy, with poor muscle bulk and absent deep tendon reflexes. He also has fasciculations on his tongue. Yeah, that's what she said, SMA, yeah. So spinal muscular atrophy, um, it's autosomal recessive, I'd leave it as that. Um, you have problems with the anterior horn cells, which are involved in motor function. Um, as a rudimentary understanding, lots of different types. They just vary in they just vary in decreasing severity and increasing age of onset. Um, the most common one you'll see is the floppy baby syndrome in type one, where they'll be hypertonic, i.e., floppy baby. They'll have weak lower limb muscles, so they'll have trouble sort of mobilizing, them, mobilizing themselves later, um, and respiratory muscles, which leads to death eventually via aspiration pneumonia. Um, various features: difficulty sitting, difficulty rolling, difficulty holding the head having a weak cry, um, having increased respiratory effort. And tr traditionally, these patients died within two years. And I'm saying that traditionally because when my exam was happened, when my exam happened, they died within two years. Now they, they don't. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and that's because of the, the magical drug called Nusi Nursin. Um, so this is a baby um, that has floppy baby syndrome just being flopped around by his parents. Um, this baby is all over YouTube by on some channel, so I'm not really stealing it from anywhere. So you can see the paradoxical breathing um, better in the next image here. So this baby is very floppy, can't hold their head straight at all. Um, and two years ago, this baby would be dead. Um, now this baby is standing. This baby is not two years old. This baby is now four years old. Um, they're reaching for things. They're standing by themselves. I mean, this is phenomenal stuff. A lot of people think neurology is just, you know, pat on the back, um, you know, and get over your hemiparesis and rehab. But a lot of things are happening in, in sort of these fields. And when I did this exam, the baby would be dead by two years. Now, because of drugs like Nusi Nursin, which converts SMA2 into SMA1, the genes, these babies have a new life. And using this treatment on the type 2 and type 3 disease, which are older, can be 
basically than a normal prognosis, which is amazing. So things like spinal fusion surgery is, is needed a lot less now. Uh, things like physiotherapy and orthotics are still needed, and this kid's wearing some orthotics. Um, that's fine. He can walk now. That's cool. Um, and respiratory care, less needed now, because now they can walk. Now they can you know, maintain their own secretions and not get aspiration pneumonia. They're not lying down all day. So these things are are interesting to see. Um, and they're just really, you know, you get a nice buzzy feeling out of it. So the next one is a three-year-old boy who's having difficulty climbing stairs and is generally unsteady on his feet. He did not walk until 22 months. He's got enlarged calf muscles. One of you guys. Yeah, Duchenne, yeah, nice. Um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, X-link recessive, so it's in boys, okay? Um, other important X-link conditions are things like maybe G6PD, which, again, exclusively in boys, but the only patient I've seen it in is a girl, uh, which is annoying for me um, to remember it. Um, the, the clinical features are progressive weakness, calf pseudohypertrophy, because the muscle gets replaced with fat, um, and uh, they get a waddling gait, Gower's sign, um, is really common as well, and the main cause of death is a dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is Gower's sign, if you haven't seen it before. Um, so they kind of assume this position, grab onto their knees, and then pull themselves up. Um, and those are the calves of someone who hasn't missed leg day since they were born. Um, but they're not really muscle, right? It's muscle replaced by fat. So they, they look like they're super tank, but they're really not. Um, Various things go wrong. Genetic testing confirms the diagnosis. Various ECG changes that you don't need to know that they're for reference. CK will be elevated, just like it would be in any sort of um, muscle, muscle condition, whether that be polymyositis, somatomyositis. Muscular dystrophy is no exception to that. What helps is steroids help a little bit. Um, and I think earlier this year, there was another steroid approved by FDA for this condition, but they don't help a lot. It's not like Nusi Nursen where it grants them a uh, whole life. Um, manage all those uh, other things, so cardiac monitoring, um, because it's a dilated cardiomyopathy, they'll have a reduced ejection fraction, so you can actually do things for it. Um, you can do things for the respiratory issues they'll have, um, physiotherapy, getting OT involved for wheelchair access to their homes, um, and special schooling may be required because some of them have intellectual disability as well. And the prognosis is poor because of their um, heart condition. They often, um, unfortunately, die at a relatively young adult age. There's another muscular dystrophy that's similar, Becker's muscular dystrophy, which is all of this, but very much mild, and they have a very normal prognosis that I didn't really talk about in any detail. Um, a five-year-old, progressively uh, unstable walking, his mother mentions he's always suffered from recent ear infections, more so than his brother. Yeah, whatever you guys are saying. Yeah, nice. Uh, ataxia telangiectasia. Uh, which, as the name suggests, um, has ataxia and has telangiectasia. Hopefully that was obvious. The other thing that they get that's not obvious is they have immunosuppression um, because they have low immunoglobulins, so they often get recurrent infections. Um, and they also have a high risk of leukemia and lymphoma, drawing back to that very first table I had, um, which is important. So investigations, you can look at the immunoglobulin levels, and AFP is sometimes high. Uh, management, not much can be done. Um, the really important thing about these patients, especially because they have a risk of lymphoma, is to avoid radiotherapy. Radiotherapy completely destroys their white cells, um, which might be okay for the lymphoma white cells, but not if you destroy all of your own white cells with radiotherapy. So that's really important. And that's an old way they used to diagnose this condition is by actually taking a sample of blood and seeing how the red cells um, reacted to radiation. So they don't do any more. Um, I think this is the last case. So a 10-year-old boy um, is brought to the uh, pediatric clinic with unsteadiness and falls. On examination, he has a wide-based gait, loss of joint position sense, nystagmus, and deformed. Inside ECG revealed uh, signs of left ventricular hypertrophy. Anyone? Friedrichs, yeah, Friedrichs ataxia, nice. Um, the other thing you want to be thinking about deformed feet is charcot marie tooth or CMT, um, but it doesn't have all these other sort of uh, and then more lateral, we have spinal cerebellar and lateral spinal, um, and lateral cortical spinal tracts. Um, dorsal roots are affected, they get areflexia, uh, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common cause of death. So they have all these posterior lateral horn, uh, sorry, posterior lateral um, The main cause of death is their cardiac problems. It's an autosomal recessive condition. No treatment is available. 
So the glass key differentiating point about these neuromimics, SMA, many different types, the infantile type is the one that's most likely to come up on your exam. Um, and it's patients can, that's what matters. Um, DMD, it's a young child, they're usually male because it's actually recessive, gala sign, really tan carbs, dilated cardiomyopathy, um, and they might have intellectual disability. Um, ataxia to telangiectasia, they're a young child, it's autosomal recessive, they have, funnily enough, ataxia, they have telangiectasia, but the important thing is they have immunosuppression. And then Friedrich's ataxia, it's autosomal recessive, they have signs associated with the posterior lateral parts of the spinal cord, um, they die from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and diabetes. So coming back to the original thing, so at the very start, things that you can take home, things that you want to be writing in the first 20 seconds of your OSCE, the differential diagnosis of abdominal mass, we went through a few of them. The ones in orange we didn't go through today, but are important considerations, um, especially uh, pyloric stenosis, um, bone pain, heaps of them, um, thrombocytopenia, heaps, Anemia, there are too many to count. Many of them you covered third year. Neutropenia, similarly. Anagranulocytosis, you guys know about. You just have to remove the um, offending agent and might, might have to give them GCSF, granulocyte colony, colony stimulating factor. Um, DDX of a limp, we went through most of them. NA, NAI is the one that you really want to be worried about. Um, and if they have a bleeding diathesis, hemarthrosis, for example, hemophilia. Um, and don't forget sort of abdominal problems as well. Um, if someone kicked one of the guys here in, in the balls, you'd be limping as well. Um, similar if the testicles got torted. Um, and of a rash, think of all those sort of rheumatoid sort of conditions. Um, good luck, you're nearly at the end um, and I'm sure you'll all do fine. Just keep the study going um, and I don't really have much else to add. So thank you very much. No, I, I don't think anyone would, like, I don't think anyone would care, yeah. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> That's okay. Thanks so much.